so, and finally, equity and sustainability. You know, I, I think when I started doing this, I didn't understand what sustainability is. You can read a definition of it, but it, it's, it's, you really need to live it or you need to go out in the world and seek it, seek you know, a sustainable life. Um, um, I caught a glimpse of what sustainability looks like uh, at some of these job sites and dirt at some of these jobs that we do where everything is is wonderful, you know, we're we're creating those jobs. We're we're providing affordable materials to the neighborhood, um, removing blighted homes, um, all those things. But we're doing them all at the same time. And the one thing I learned is that if we're ever going to achieve that state of being, we need everyone involved. Every people group is either employed and or they are are uh, they're looking to buy these materials to complete that cycle that we find in the circular economy. We need demand, we need supply. So, and we need everyone to be uh, involved in that. So next slide. So we do value um, scale and equity as our, our kind of our number one thing. The scale part is about um, getting all the materials involved, all the buildings that are coming down, right? And then the equity part is getting all the people groups involved. So uh, we, and then, the, so they come hand in hand. If you want to do this at scale, you need a lot of people involved. If you want to have a lot of people involved, you're going to deal, you know, you're going to divert a lot of materials. And so um, I just want to, you know, we'll, we'll keep talking about that theme of like, you. it isn't enough to say, hey, we, we're happy we got our building deconstructed, now we can stop. You have to complete the cycle by, um, by using reclaimed materials as well. So next slide. Okay, so let's go through some deconstruction 101. Next slide. We're gonna just talk about some of the basics. Um, the circular workforce, as I call it, basically, uh, it's funny to be talking about that in today's world, because a lot of times you hear about people that are, they, they can't find enough workers. Um, you hear stories about people leaving the workforce. And um, in fact, I, you know, I, I just heard a story about people leaving the workforce. Um, they feel sort of disenfranchised. They, they, they have sort of, I mean, to some degree, they've lost hope. You know, they don't, they don't see a future and and they are, are confused and they're, they're wandering. And so what we do is, you know, a, a lot of people, we help them find direction. Um, the reuse industry and the circular economy is something where you can be in it for one hour. You can be working in it for one hour and you've already done good for your community in just that amount of time. A lot of times that's without any training or anything. You're already doing good um, the moment you start. And every day you get a, you might get a pat on the back, or you might not. People might not, you know, realize. But it's a wonderful career. It provides a lot of, um, hopefully, living wage jobs for people uh, that um, are looking for meaning in their in their work. And um, and that's that's a big part of what we do. There's so much, uh, so many benefits to what we do. Some of them are coming simultaneously. And that is why um, so many people get hooked on this and do it for years and years. So, you know, but you can see the cycle uh, listed here of the cycle of materials. And it always comes back to who's gonna reuse these things to keep it um, going, the cycle going. So next slide. Okay, this is a slide that I really, um, it's, uh, this is an older version of it. So I need to change some of the numbers, but let me let me just say this, and I want you all to listen because I, I, I'm not sure I do a good job of explaining it, but I'm gonna try. Um, I like numbers. I, I look at numbers and sometimes I can see trends and, and, uh, and look deeper into the numbers. When I looked at how much the average American wastes in a day, I multiplied that not by a day, but by an, a lifetime's worth of days 
And that ended up being 130 some thousand pounds that we throw away. That's, be, that's while we're recycling our bottles and cans, by the way, 130 some thousand pounds. And you know what? Because we often weigh the homes that we're taking apart. I realize the average American home that I'm taking apart is also 130 some thousand pounds. And what that means is the average American home is equivalent to a lifetime's worth of waste. And when you choose to demolish the average American home, you're choosing to waste a lifetime's worth of materials in one day. And I hope that makes sense to everyone because it's, it's something that people choose readily without thinking about it. And we're trying to get them to realize what impact that actually makes. They're like, that's just one home. But it is more than that. And um, it's, it's funny because we, we also um, did some math and we realized that if we had one home, we could keep one worker going for an entire year. Um, when, I, when I looked at the, the various ways that we can not just take the building apart and recycle some of it, but also the, what, how we sell some of it and we remanufacture it into new products, things like that. So there are, um, I think it's over 350,000 structures are, are demolished every year. And so it has a huge potential of job creation and um, other benefits, but um, it all starts with somebody, you know, thinking through the choice and realizing demolition isn't the best choice. Um, next slide. One more thing, I, I always tell people demolition is like you pay someone to throw all of your possessions away so the next day you can go to the store and buy them all over again. And um, that's me trying to tell people that when they think demolition might be cheaper, they need to think twice about that as well. Um, because when we do deconstruction, a lot of times our clients will keep some of the materials and that helps offset the cost. But anyway, um, what is this thing about? Um, these are some trends that we've seen over the last 30 years. We've seen that there are more buildings than ever, more buildings out there than we ever had before. And the quality in, of the materials that we're seeing in some of the newer buildings is decreasing. It's degrading. Um, some of the materials, I went to Home Depot, they had some materials on display. They were already broken and they were on display. They weren't even in use yet. So that's scary. Um, unfortunately, the ability to recycle materials, that's dropping. And um, the age of buildings that are being demolished, that's dropping. Why is that important? Because that means that when you architects and designers are designing a building and you're saying, oh, that I'm basing it on 100 years, it probably won't last 100 years. You might have built it to last 100 years, but it will probably be repurposed, the land will be repurposed and everybody's getting crowded. There's always a building where you wanna build a building. And um, that means that um, buildings are being replaced before they wear out. So that's an important uh, little factoid that we've seen. Next slide. Okay, so we're gonna talk about some of the challenges. Like it sounds like deconstruction is a good idea. We should do that. Well, why, what are some of the challenges to doing that? Why is it not happening, right? Um, it's, it's such a great idea. Everyone's in support now, everybody wants it, but why are they not doing it? Next slide. Let's try this. Um, one of the uh, things you might not have thought about, and I bet Eric deals with this a lot at, in, you know, and, and, and Dave in, in Vermont, <clears throat> you know, we might, here's 25, I think, it, yeah, 25 categories of materials that we deal with. And so does Home Depot, frankly, but, um, um, but we're dealing with all sorts of materials that we uh, come across. The only difference between us and Home Depot is that we deal with all materials from every year, from perhaps the early 1800s to 2022, and they just deal with materials from 2022. We're dealing with antique materials. We're dealing with things we don't even know what it's for. We, we look at it and I'm like, I don't know what that thing is. And so it is a challenge. It's a challenge to identify it, figure it out, 
uh, organize it, display it, things like that. Next slide. Um, we're dealing with the, the, the fact that we, uh, uh, in one, you know, early on, I was bragging about how many jobs we can create, and now I'm afraid to mention it because uh, people are saying they can't find any workers. Um, the only thing that we have going for us on that that I, I think is really powerful is that our work is meaningful and we have a way of attracting people, maybe even bringing them back into the workforce to do something important. Um, whereas they, you know, working at a, a, a fast food restaurant or something like that wasn't working for them. And so, uh, but I, I think we do have the capacity if we can inspire them as the, the, the theme of this uh, event today. So next slide. If you ever come to one of my talks and you realize I, I'm doing this all on, on the fly, I don't have anything written down. <laughs> And I have no idea how many slides I have. I, I just I'm hoping I get it done before I run out of time. So let's keep going here. Um, but what is this about? This is basically this slide is saying that I come across buildings. Uh, we all come across buildings. They, it seems like they were designed for demolition. Like when they designed and built the building, they, they wanted it to be demolished. So um, Construction adhesive, we're doing a building right now that's only seven years old, a house that we're taking down, it's only seven years old. They glued it all together. They actually glued the sheetrock to the walls, thanks a lot. Um, and um, so that's a problem. Spray foam insulation, hey, if you're gonna spray it on, figure out a way to unspray it, I don't know. <laughs> there has to be an anti-spray foam out there, right? but there isn't. So everything you spray that on, it turns into instant garbage because you can't get it off and they won't, it, people won't reuse it, they won't recycle it. So you're turning your buildings into instant garbage. So if you thought it was a, a, an environmentally friendly product, you, you, you have to account for all aspects of a product, including the end of life, right? And so um, another thing is, um, everybody loves their their pneumatic nail guns, and I apparently because they're using in in un I mean in unbelievable amount of fasteners in some projects, uh, way more than you normally would need, um, and so that's a problem. But you know there are other problems too that we're dealing with. You know you think hey we no longer have to deal with uh, asbestos and lead, but we have all these other challenges that we're having to deal with. And, and a lot of that is inferior materials that um, we simply um, are baffled by how we're going to get people to reuse them um, or how they were even purchased in the first place. In uh, next slide. So commercial building materials, you know, that's something that it, I love that architects and designers are, are constantly coming to me and saying, what do we do with commercial building materials? Because that's their, maybe that's their world. They live in the world of hospitals and institution, you know, institutional buildings or commercial or uh, fast uh, fashion, you know, and uh, retail where the, it has to be fresh and new all the time. And and we are tackling that at our own pace. Um, one of the problems with uh, the circular economy is that the, um, the supply and demand sides have to be uh, equal. Well, it sounds like the normal economy, frankly, but um, we are, uh, if we can't get commercial building owners to buy reclaimed materials, then how can we take commercial materials? There's an imbalance there that you probably, so again, we're holding people accountable. They need to use reclaimed materials and that will create a vacuum of demand um, and that one must be filled. And so then the, the supply will come. And so we, we are trying to get more people to create that demand, uh, which will then stimulate a supply. Um, it's really hard to get contractors to do deconstruction if they are faced with, I don't have any clue what I'm gonna do with this stuff or who I'm gonna sell it to. That is very scary to them. So, um, but we love commercial building materials. They're such good quality a lot of times. Um, sometimes they're in larger quantities, which is really uh, some economies of scale and efficient. And uh, let's move on to the next slide. That, that picture was from a hospital that we did with Skanska, a huge uh, 
wonderful contractor that we deal with. Uh, so how about some success stories? Let's go to the next slide. It's always good to have some, some success stories and to offset those challenges. So <clears throat> what have we done? We just focused on what we wanted. That's how. We, we focused on buildings that had things that we wanted. We didn't let things that we didn't want um, stand in our way. Uh, things like um, uh, we, you know, we would certainly uh, value a building with metal roofing over a building with asphalt shingles, for example, but we're not going to let, we're gonna figure out a way to get asphalt shingles off more quickly and recycle them so that we can get to the things that we do want and we want to save for reuse because that's where the maximum benefit comes. And uh, it's a simple concept, but it's something that has helped guide us. You know, there are buildings that we, um, uh, you know, will not do like buildings that are burned or something like that because there's really no point. And we're, and there, there are so few of us that we, we have to keep moving and keep saving things. Uh, next slide. Here is a, an actual project that we did. Um, uh, we were able to turn around this project that normally we would have had a, a lot smaller um, diversion rate. And we, um, uh, it was just an amazing um, project where we, you know, 62% of the building reused, uh, you know, only 4% was thrown away. And that, uh, that was great. A lot of that came from our recycling was sorted at the site and that allowed for, you know, like 100% diversion of a particular thing like scrap metal or scrap wood, for example. So, um, and, and I think part of the, you know, what it, why is this a success story? It's because when we take on projects where most of the building is reusable, um, that it that sets us up for success because that material has value and it doesn't cost you anything to throw it away because you're not throwing it away, right? So um, we threw very little away. So that gave us an advantage over demolition where they were throwing everything away and they incurred a lot of costs doing so. Next slide. So, um, you know, sometimes the the uh, the strategy is to um, um, I I know that I'm doing this work without um, without any advantages. Let's say we don't have a deconstruction ordinance. No, there are no recycling requirements where I live. Um, we don't have any job training dollars. We don't have any donations. We don't have any. Dave, you're you're on mute. Can you hear me still? Yes. Now we now we can. Yeah. Okay. So when um, when you look at what we've been able to accomplish without all of those things, imagine what we could have accomplished with those things, right? And so we, um, you know, when there are pots of money out there to provide community benefits, and we are a great way to provide a community benefit. So there. You might go to a community where there are dollars for job, green collar job training, things like that, helping different populations. Um, and that can be a great way to make deconstruction work where you're getting, uh, uh, you're, you're providing a benefit to the community, but that is also um, helping control your costs, especially your costs of labor. So that can be a good strategy. Next slide. Okay, so you know one of the things we do is we 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 have to come into every project and say we want to make a positive impact on every project, even if we aren't allowed to deconstruct it. And so everyone can get started doing deconstruction on their project, or they can start doing the work if they if they start somewhere. And and that's what we want people to do is to get started, and not wait for everything to align. So. Um, um, this is an example of a kitchen remodel where we are about to remove this kitchen for, um, we remove all the used cabinets and appliances and counters and things like that, sometimes flooring and other materials, but all of that is reusable and it's a, it's a great um, benefit to the building owner. And it's great uh, for us because we're getting paid to remove it and then we get paid for the cabinets. So we get paid twice and um, Sometimes we go even go into a building and we just work for 
one day and we just salvage everything. We even do it for free uh, in certain parts of the country. So um, it depends on what the value of the material is. Uh, but the, the idea is to try and save as much as you can before uh, everything gets destroyed and wasted. Um, uh, our operation in one year, we removed 300 kitchen cabinet sets and we sold 300 kitchen cabinet sets in that year. And that's important to keep the cycle going, right? So next slide. Um, we get materials in, sometimes they, they are blemished. They need a repair. We have a repair station for that. That's awesome. So we do repairs. Not all, not everything, but we try. And sometimes we, um, we, we see something where we could add value to something. This was an old sign that was tacked to the wall and it didn't have a frame. And so we took some old reclaimed wood and we made a frame. And you know what? The frame looked as old as the sign because it is as old as the sign. And so we added a lot of value to that sign and we were able to sell it for more money. And, um, and what you know what that is? means to me that means a, a good paying job of somebody who's uh, fulfilled in their work and they're excited to come to work every day because they're doing something that's interesting and fun and creative and um, and it's great to get new people younger people to do things like that so next slide So I was asked to talk about the uh, Portland deconstruction ordinance because I was involved from not quite day one, but I was involved uh, heavily in that. And I, um, uh, they, you know, right in the beginning, we were saying, how are we going to do this? And it was at the beginning, it was about incentives, you know, where they would incentivize people to deconstruct and, and salvage buildings, and they would provide some money to um, encourage that. And, um, and then they, they got, you know, when we started building up infrastructure, we started training contractors before the ordinance was in place so that when it was in place, there would be contractors that you could call. They were trained. I trained all of the contractors and certified them so that they were ready to do the work. And when, when they were asked to do the work, um, it's because they were on a specific list that the, the city of Portland uh, said, you, if you want to do, if you want to remove a home or a duplex in the city of Portland, you have to use one of these contractors because they are certified to do the work. And so there was a lot of regulation there. Some people are against that, but I think it turned out great. Um, the scary part was, oh no, the you know, the deconstructors are gonna charge us a lot of money. And it turned out that because we did the training, we trained them to work uh, fast and efficient and safe. Um, they had other contractors just like them to compete with. So the costs quickly dropped and, um, and became competitive with demolition pricing, believe it or not. So very excited about that. And all of the materials that have been uh, saved, hundreds of buildings, hundreds of buildings now. Now about, I think, I mean, I'm just estimating, but two thirds of the buildings, the homes and duplexes that are removed in Portland are now deconstructed from, because of this ordinance, about one third of them are either demolished or they may still be deconstructed by people who, where they aren't making them do it, but they are, um, they are volunteering to do it. And so, Hundreds of, I mean, over a hundred jobs created, um, lots and lots of affordable building materials returned to the community. Lots of people um, working uh, in, in something that they care about. Um, a very healthy way to take a building down. That was one of their priorities um, as far as comparative to the demolition dust cloud that we see and the fact that a lot of buildings are demolished with asbestos in them, um, despite everyone's effort to follow all the rules, there's still asbestos in them. And so um, that was one of the big things. If you're into health and safety for your community, I can tell you a lot about that because um, we uh, deconstruction is a solution for that. Not just all of those other benefits I told you about here. Here's just one more that I hadn't mentioned. So. Um, but we built up the infrastructure and then we um, trained, you know, by training and getting new reuse stores started, 
um, so that there was some demand for the materials and so far so good. Um, it's, it's uh, once somebody does it like Portland, then other communities uh, are, are able to move forward with their efforts because they have a guide, they, they have someone that took the leap and tried it. And, um, but I, I, am, I am working, I'm going to Portland uh, later this week because it takes a lot of maintenance to keep it going. Um, next slide. So sorry to interrupt, Dave. Um, Kathy, I just wanted to do a quick time check to ensure we have enough time for the Q&A portion after Dave's presentation. Um, thank you. I think we're good for a couple of minutes because we're close to the end of his presentation. Thank you, Olivia. Great. Okay, so next slide. So where are we heading with all of this? Um, we, we need to head to a future where it isn't so hard to take buildings apart, frankly. Um, designing for disassembly is a, a, a trend in architecture where you know, the architect or designer or the engineer, they're thinking about like, when I put this together, how is it being taken apart? Or am I gluing this together and how do I get the glue off or whatever, whatever they're doing to think about like how to make this easier. So next slide. We can't wait for that by the way. So we're gonna rely on things like the circular economy and people being excited about that. And everybody's an expert in the circular economy now. So that's great. <laughs> And, um, and, but it is about, you know, like, let's, we, we're going to do everything we can to make deconstruction work um, in the, in the meantime, but maybe eventually it'll get easier to take buildings apart. I won't be around for that. But next slide. But back to the design for disassembly, here's a building where it's all these interlocking timbers and um, not only is it easier to take apart, it's easier to put back together. And these are buildings, uh, we've done about 20 of these buildings now, where we label all the parts and they get reassembled at the new location, 99% reuse of that structure. And that is another benefit of design for disassembly is that a higher percentage of the building is going to be saved for reuse. That's more benefits all around. So next slide. But like I said, I'm going back and forth. We can't wait. We can't wait for design for disassembly. So we are doing it today. And I realized, here's what I did. Um, I took a wall apart. It took me hours. I took a wall apart. I pried it apart. I pulled all the nails. We recycled material. We saved what we could. We brought it to the store. We sold it to someone. I said, what are you going to do with that? And they go, I'm going to build a wall. And I was like, what? I just took the wall apart. What in the world? Why did I do that? So I started selling intact walls. I started selling intact sections of floor. If you want an eight by 12 shed, I will cut you, guess what? I'll cut you an eight foot by 12 foot section of floor structure intact, put it on your trailer, two eight foot walls, two 12 foot walls, and you're on your way to having your shed. I didn't have to take it apart. You didn't have to put it back together. Amazing. So we call them post-fab panels, not pre-fab panels, post-fab panels. And it's, it's a big hit. Um, there are, I, I think, 125 structures made of these now. These aren't big structures. They're not making homes with these. Um, but I'm not saying you couldn't. I'm just saying talk to your local jurisdiction about that. But it is an amazing uh, benefit. It's made deconstruction faster and cheaper and, and make uh, the use of the materials more attractive. It's faster and easier to build a structure out of them. So next slide. Um, and uh, let's just skip that one. Next slide. So I think this is my final slide. <clears throat> After all this time and trying so hard and trying to come up with all these innovative techniques, which I didn't have time to tell you about, um, I realized still that it's still a hard business to be in. And so we, I came up with the idea of the Reuse Innovation Center. And what it is, it's not a reuse store, it's a reuse center. It means that we take 10 different businesses and they all work synergistically together. Some of them uh, do deconstruction. Some of them make reclaimed wood tables. Some of them repair appliances, whatever it is. And they all work together in this reuse innovation center. And um, they, they, are, they, they help each other. They, they complement each other. 
and things like that. There's a lot of job training that goes on there. That's amazing. You have uh, lots of job training opportunities for as far as that goes. But basically it's saying, we're gonna share costs. We're gonna to work together. We don't have to do this all on our own. We're gonna do this in volume. We're gonna do this at scale. And, um, and it's gonna be amazing for whatever community. And it, we're gonna create new businesses to fill this center. And a lot of those people might be uh, from disadvantaged populations. And th this is their chance to work, not for someone else, but to work for themselves. And we're going to help them do that because it's going to be this uh, uh, inclusive and 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 uh, supportive environment. So very excited about that. If you have more questions, let me know. Next slide. That is it. I was right. I had no idea if that was the last slide. I was just going to make it the last slide. <laughs> That's all I got. Thank you so much, Dave. That was just. Talk about inspiring, right? Just amazing. What a wealth of information. Um, I'm going to ask Brooke if we have any questions in the chat and we can ask Dave because there's so much to share, I'm sure here. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm unmuted. Thank you, Kathy. Sorry about sure. that. Um, yeah, so there's been lots of conversation in the chat um, and a few people have shared resources, but I think right now um, we, and I know I have some questions, um, but I think I'm, I'm not seeing anything that we need. Well, let's see, okay, actually here's, here's one. What is the typical time to deconstruct an average size house? And that actually relates to one of my questions was, which was going to be, you know, we're all familiar with the expression time is money um because labor is time and that's money um so how does deconstruction compete with traditional demolition methods um and then the, the related question what's the typical time to deconstruct um an average size house so maybe um dave can speak to that i know that probably some of our that there are the other presenters could answer this as well so but we'll give dave Benick a shot at it I've got the great answer for you. The first house that we ever took down took three and a half weeks. We had absolutely no idea what we were doing. There was no one to teach us how to do it. I had to figure it out. If I did that house today, it took three and a half weeks. If I did that house today, if, if it took more than three and a half days, I would be disappointed. Mm -hmm. So we have gotten faster because we've been more efficient. We tend to use some equipment, not to destroy things, but to move things around like forklifts, you know, that we use to make uh, the back breaking part of the work a little easier and a little faster. And so basically because of that, we're able to get through a house faster, which is great for construction schedules. We use less labor hours um, to do that. And that is great for bid costs um, and, um, but it's still tough. I mean, it's still tough to do that. The only advantage, you know, one of the main advantages to us that help um, keep bid costs down is now that we can do like three times more buildings in a year that we can, uh, some of those fixed costs of, of life are, are, are diluted over more projects. And that's why I mentioned scale. So like when we achieved a hundred buildings in one year, one year, um, that was uh, where you really started to feel um, the benefits of moving faster. And we were able to tackle more projects and save more good materials, so. Th thank you. I think I think we wanna dig more into this, um, this notion after our next speaker or, or speakers, um, because I think that's, that is sort of the burning question is how do we, this is sort of a niche um, industry right now, or maybe even it's a movement, the way recycling was a movement, you know, 40 years ago, and um, even diverting organics was, a, you know, started as a movement 15, 20 years ago. So how do we take it sort of to scale, so to speak, um, but let's, um, and we know that there's the supply and demand um, issue as part of it, but let's, um, let's go ahead and go to our next um, presenters, Kathy, because I think, um, I think we're ready and then we'll get back to the, I see a couple of the questions here, but we will, we will get back to those. Okay, very good. So let's move on and then we'll have time at the end to do Q and A for yeah. all the presenters. So thank you, Brooke. Um, 
Now I'm going to introduce our next speaker. We have Eric Kruger here, who has been in the building trades since 1997, when he was teaching carpentry in Antigua, West Indies, as part of the Peace Corps Crisis Corps. And in Vermont, he has worked for several general contractors and on his own. In 2005, he founded the nonprofit Renew Building Materials and Salvage and is consulted with and later ran the deconstruction program at Finger Lakes Reuse in Ithaca, New York. He holds a degree in wildlife management and environmental ethics, and he's happiest when he's diverting building materials at a job site in the company of other like-minded, conscientious deconstructors or on the wood floors of a local contra dance with his family. He lives in a straw bale home he built with ecological features, including solar electric, solar hot water, composting toilet and masonry wood heater oven. Also, he partners with Dave Giese, who's part of our planning team, who started out exploring homes while performing energy audits after graduating with a degree in environmental and resource engineering from SUNY in 1986. He continued in the nonprofit sector at a food bank in Seattle and weatherization program um, in Washington state. And after hiking the Appalachian Trail in 2000, he moved back east and started deconstructing houses while working for the Restore in Springfield, Massachusetts. Dave started his own deconstruction company, Piece by Piece Deconstruction in 2010 and joined deconstruction work full time in 2019. He likes building furniture out of reused materials and he continues to try to hike and canoe as much as possible while earmarking a few hours to pull some nails. So um, we're delighted to welcome both of these folks here today and um, we'll start with Eric, the floor is yours. Oh, Thank you. Hear. Oh, gotcha, thanks. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I first wanna give a shout out to Dave whose um, credentials in this uh, field are, both Dave's actually are, are well-founded. Uh, we are a, a small collegiate group, the deconstructionists, and have uh, done this work for a number of years, often quietly, but we're starting to get a little bit more public attention. Um, you can advance to my first slide and I can't see myself on the screen, I can only see you. Um, some of the questions that, um, that people have about deconstruction, um, especially if they're a contractor, how does it compare? Um, Dave made note that um, our first speaker, that, um, that the cost can be competitive. And certainly I don't expect a general contractor trying out deconstruction on their own to be profitable the first go around, but there are revenue streams and cost savings in deconstruction um, as were alluded to. Here in the Northeast, our, our tipping rate is, is rapidly increasing. We don't have a lot of landfill space in New England. So therefore a lot of our, a lot of our waste is shipped out of the area, um, oftentimes on trains to Ohio or something like that. Um, in Vermont, we're looking at um, over $1,000 for a, a full dumpster. Um, we're looking at uh, upwards of $200 a ton for self-tipping. And so the more materials we can keep out of the, uh, the dumpster, um, there's a cost savings there. And then there's the, uh, the savings of being able to put that material uh, in, into someone else's hand for reuse. Um, for commercial work, um, we're often cost competitive uh, because we, um, we're doing what's called site separation, which has been encouraged for a long time. That's where you have a job site with multiple um, multiple receptacles from multiple kinds of trash. Now that's not always feasible in every site, but there are things like dump trailers. You can stage stuff on pallets. Um, we're able to um, divert asphalt shingles, uh, we're able to divert um, ceiling tiles. Obviously the, the metal is easily recyclable. So if you're doing a commercial interior of 10,000 square feet that's got drop ceiling and you can get Armstrong to come out and take all those uh, ceiling tiles at no charge, uh, you've just saved yourself thousands of dollars in disposal cost. Uh, so we're cost competitive on commercial interiors. It's hard for us to find markets for um, the volume that comes out of commercial um, interiors, as Dave mentioned, but there's often framing, um, steel studs, other, other items that can be sold. There are also niche markets nationwide that are focusing on items like commercial three-foot door slabs 
which uh, are readily reusable. Um, whole house deconstruction, we, we've got um, folks who are, um, we're, we're basically, we're, we're training contractors for their own deconstruction. And we, um, we run into hiccups at the beginning because they don't know the value of the materials and they don't know the way to take them out carefully enough to reuse them. And they're also um, not necessarily paying attention to details like professional plumbers will take out a bathroom fixture, but they won't put the set screws back into it. And now they've got a piece of scrap metal instead of a usable faucet. So that's, that's part of the training of, of taking materials out in uh, a whole house project is keeping the materials reusable whether it be processing it immediately or um, you know, having Ziploc bags ready to put all the bits and pieces in. Um, and we also, um, in the cost comparison sort of general topic, um, we do that, that photo that Dave showed of the, of the kitchen, that a nice oak kitchen that's immediately reusable just as it is. Um, we often um, work with um, homeowners who can realize a pretty significant um, tax benefit to donating their materials to a charity and that creates the tax benefit creates a budget for work that could be um, that could be done for a fee as he mentioned um, we've done a, a lot of sort of higher end houses where we just go through and we skim out or soft strip the easy stuff that's the windows and doors the flooring um, the appliances um, the metals and uh, a lot of times people will have contents a lot of these houses have been remodeled um, prior to sale, um, mature landscaping, a hardscape. There's a lot of there's a lot of things on a on a project that can be um, can be reused if you have markets for them, and that that helps the cost as well. We um, generally like to um, we're we're more of a boutique business. Um, Dave Bennett goes around the country getting local reuse stores started and, and tackling. Um, these projects and really building up infrastructure in, in around the country, which is a fabulous benefit. We're, we're sort of focused in uh, a portion of New England and we are, um, we're working for general contractors sort of as their, as their green demolition sub. Um, we're, we're going through houses that are between 50 and 70 years old um, that still have high quality materials, whether it's from the 60s or the 80s. And we're, we're turning studs back into studs. Um, our, our wood stream doesn't go into alternate daily cover. It doesn't go into biomass. Um, it doesn't go into biomass generation. It really is stud being reused as a stud. Um, and, um, you know, there is a place for reusing barns. Um, there are, um, the, any project can be a successful project, but there's certainly projects that I come I look at that say this is just you know this is you don't need a human backhoe to take this project down there are projects that just don't have enough value they've got too many layers before you get to what you're after which is framing lumber or structural lumber it doesn't have um, any high-end finishes in it um we um our particular business um really tends to attract um, customers from a couple of different streams. We've got homeowners that really want to see the right thing done. Um, they've got a, a structure that they've, um, they've fallen in love with. It has history. Maybe it's a beach house or something like that. They don't want to see it disappear in two days. Um, we've also got um, people who are buying maybe waterfront properties or um, an, an attractive neighborhood and they're, they're buying the house to crush it. Another house is going to go there and they're feeling guilty about that. They want to do the right thing. Um, and we also have um, contractors and, and um, site guys who realize that um, through experience working with us, we can be, we're a trained workforce that can, can take care of their problem on a, um, on a cost competitive basis and add all these benefits of workforce training, you know, diverted waste, um, reduced toxins in the environment, um, the historic, the historic house parts aspect, and I think the part that gives me the most heart is people who are moderate to low income, um, who are unable to remodel or um, 
build the project they want to on the existing on their budget because the cost of new materials is so high. Um, Excuse me, Eric, for one second. This is Kathy. I'm just going to forward through the slides slowly so people yeah, can sorry. see them. Would that be work That's for you? Fine. Thank yeah. you. So the first slide before she pushes the button, um, we got hired by a contractor uh, when I was at Finger Lakes Reuse, the left image of the cedar siding. That's all um, clear grain cedar siding. Um, they were going to do a um, deep energy retrofit where they were gonna add insulation to the outside of the building. They didn't end up reusing that material on site. We were able to sell that to folks to do things like sheds and dog houses and stuff. And clear grain cedar is not cheap. So that was a definite win. The uh, project on the right was a uh, small camp all built out of rough lumber. It was completely inaccessible to, um, to a tra traditional roll off container service, that sort of thing. It was off the grid. Uh, it had a lot, of, um, a lot of items in it that a, a small homeowner might be interested in uh, or a homesteader might be interested in. So we got um, off grid appliances out of there. We got um, that kind of thing. Um, from that project. We can forward to the next slide. Um, this, uh, um, the, these are projects that we've done in the last month. Um, the, uh, both of these projects are not charitable donation projects. These are um, on the left, a, a homeowner, and on the right, a, a, a property management company. Both had buildings that were um, unsafe and um, need to be removed. And in the case of the timber frame on the left, we had to do quite a bit of structural stabilization just to make it safe to take it down. I'm not sure if this picture shows it, um, but there's, um, there's a series of, if you look closely at the image, there's a series of ratchet straps holding this, uh, this timber frame together. And um, these are all hand-hewn chestnut lumber, which was reused by the, uh, the homeowner in their other barn remodel. The, uh, the large structure here is, uh, was an old bowling alley that got built and then lifted so that it was out of the floodplain, but in the process of lifting it, the building was damaged and sat unused for a period of time. This uh, property management company out of Boston, uh, we'd already stripped out um, 10,000 square feet of interior space for them utilizing the services of Armstrong, as mentioned in the, uh, the chat. And so they came to us first and said, hey, there's a lot of good material out here. Um, can you bid? And it turns out this project, we were, uh, we were cost competitive with demolition on this one. Um, these two projects were not charitable donation projects, but again, still cost competitive. Next slide. Um, we love seeing um, photos that come from our, our um, customers. Um, the, uh, we, we save slate, we save, um, timber frame pieces for mantles. We sell a variety of windows, whether they're going into a chicken coop or a shed, or, you know, we oftentimes are asked by contractors to pull a, a hundred window schedule that's only 20 years old because the new buyer wants to remodel. And the old windows were aluminum green um, Marvin windows, and now they want to put in something different. Mm -hmm. And um, so for the, for the homeowner, as well as for the general contractor, having somebody who's used to doing the work who can perform it on a timely basis is a boon. And on a project with that many high-end windows, if the person chooses to donate them to a charity, then they are um, realizing significant charitable donation. And uh, I'm happy after the talk to, uh, to walk through the process. It really involves, the process of charitable donation really involves three, three parties, a, a qualified deconstruction company that's going to take care in removing the equipment. Um, a nonprofit charity such as the Center for Ecological Technology in Western Mass or the Boston Building Materials Resource Center out in Boston. These are charities whose mission it is to accept building materials and um, they can put these materials in the hands of someone who can reuse them. And the third player is um, a, a, um, a licensed and or um, a an appraiser who's familiar working with building materials. And there are a variety of appraisers out there. Not all of them are qualified to appraise uh, used building materials. It's a great partnership. We, um, we work with these folks, I'd say probably 60% of the projects we do in the Southern part of the state, less so in the North and um, realize significant uh, benefits for the homeowner. Um, it, we have a unique um, situation with the, uh, 
Center for Ecological Technology and their um, eco building bargains, whereby since we're so distant from them, we actually market a lot of materials from these projects ourselves. And um, this is something uh, as a general contractor doing deconstruction, you may find yourself doing as well, where um, we don't want the materials to stockpile on the job site. We don't want them to get weather damaged. We don't want to move them four times. So um, as a business, we've developed a um, sort of a robust online presence uh, of people who are working on their own homes, um, who know we have materials. Next slide, please. And so um, we, um, our materials go to a combination of the reuse store themselves, um, architectural salvage firms who buy from us and homeowners who are working on their own projects. Not a lot of materials goes to general contractors unless they are small general contractors who, who um, emphasize the reuse of materials in their workforce. Uh, in this center photo, we're removing a, a unique period piece from Williams College that went to the Rehouse um, in Rochester, New York, run by a colleague, Sally. And on the right-hand side is a perfect example of um, creative reuse. On the left-hand side is a little bit of shenanigans. <laughs> So um, we really focus on um, all kinds of materials um, from the big and bulky to the, um, to the um, generic, almost everything um, has a market. And if you as a contractor or as a reuse store get a reputation for having, for example, high quality kitchen cabinets as Eco Building Bargains does, or affordable you know, doors for um, property managers who want to replace their hollow core doors that the tenants have kicked out. Um, you know, we're, we're selling things at modest prices. So those, those blown glass lamps on the left-hand side, I think we sold those for $20 a piece. Um, at, I believe that's pine flooring we're looking at down below. Um, if we don't wholesale that um, to a wood processor we work with, uh, we're selling direct to the homeowner for two to three dollars a square foot and it comes back to the point that dave made earlier which is we're a fee for service company so we're already charging the homeowner a contractor to take their house down just like they would pay an excavator to do it but we're finding value on the back end um, by selling this material and we're also greatly reducing our dumpster stream um, we're doing a three or four thousand square foot house right now. We're probably going to be three dumpsters on that. That big a bowling alley, which was 60 by 250. Uh, we did asphalt shingle recycling on that. We did uh, clean wood composting on that. I think our total C and D dumpster haul out was three dumpsters out of that thing that was 60 by 200 and something feet. Everything else is being reused or composted or recycled. Um, next slide. So for us, we are, we are selling, um, we are selling from the job site um, and remitting that money to the charity or we're selling, um, we're bringing things back to our two bay garage and, and posting them there until somebody can come pick them up. Uh, every now and then we'll deliver because, um, because people don't have the means to, to take volume. If I've got somebody who wants to buy a um, hundred boards for me and it's on my truck anyway, and I'm driving to the job site, I may swing that by their house. Um, incentives demystified, this really is talking about the charitable donation process. Um, you have a, a million dollar house you bought, um, but that million dollar house includes the price of the real estate, it includes the cost of, you know, the value of having the house be there. Um, but that million dollar house is probably worth at least $100,000 as a pile of two by fours and kitchen cabinets and HVAC equipment and um, hardscape and patios and pressure treated decks, you know, Douglas fir beadboard porch ceilings. Um, there's a lot of value in a house, things that you don't usually see. And um, donating these materials to a charity at a tax rate, you know, of 25%, you can see how a $100,000 charitable donation value almost covers the cost of deconstruction. Um, and if, if somebody is inspired to deconstruct, but they, they can't take advantage of the itemized charitable donation because um, the personal um, allowance has gone up now and they just want to do it for good reasons, then, then we sell the material and, and we, we 
keep all the profit for ourselves, and we use that to uh, we use that to uh, offset some of the cost of de deconstruction. the The whole topic of charitable donation is is in itself its own um, presentation, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that now. Let's move on. So here's an example of a project up at Lake Winnipesaukee. Um, the folks wanted to remodel their house to make it more accessible for a um, family member who is um, severely disabled, uh, mobility disabled. Um, that's probably not the right word to use. Uh, they had accessibility issues in this current waterfront house. We did not take this whole house down, but we did spend um, probably a good day and a half uh, taking out these um, Pella skylights, taking out all this Douglas fir beadboard. This particular porch was over a thousand square feet. I have photos from three different buyers who used this in their project. They were able to match existing. They were able to do some wainscot. Um, this whole house, the whole schedule of windows from this house was reusable. The porch ceiling was. It had some uh, other decking in there that was reusable. Some porches are made out of mahogany. And if you follow the state of tropical hardwood forest, forest harvest, it makes a lot of sense to um, to try to keep some of these higher value items out of the landfill. Next. So um, I mentioned earlier, a um, hundred window schedule, um, green clad uh, Marvin window schedule, 20 years old. So this is a, what I call a frequent flyer, a customer who's developed a relationship with us over time. Um, the only used materials you can see in this building right now are the, is the window schedule. Um, I think they might have spent a total of $3,000 on these windows. Um, these these uh, triple casements were probably selling for about $400 from me. Um, the sliders, that gable end, a large piece there was probably five or $600. If you quote for new windows in a project like this, you're probably looking at $15,000 to $20,000. These folks in rural Vermont and they're trying to work on a budget. So we've really, we've created a masterpiece here and, and that's not, this is not the only customer that benefited from, the, from these windows. I actually had six window packages sold from this project. So one house that was being remodeled by a conscientious contractor benefited six moderate income project uh, homeowners in Vermont. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a beautiful site in, um, in Western Mass, we're working right now for a contractor, Jack Miller Contracting, uh, just like my colleague um, Dave up north. We have a, a number of high-end contractors who just call us on a regular basis because they know the work's going to be done carefully and in a timely manner. In this particular case, this building um, foundation is going to be reused, as are uh, some of the components of the floor structure, et cetera. Um, we can save this plywood. We can save headers as headers, framing as framing. And we actually have, as Dave mentioned, with this panelized building, we actually have somebody buying the whole garage. We have somebody buying the whole mezzanine. And it's just a, a, a measured and numbered uh, lumber package. We've done, uh, we've done log houses the same way as Dave has. Um, and, and folks know us, again, through web presence, through word of mouth. Um, they've seen our work. They've seen our signs. They're looking for an alternative. They know, they know this is perfectly good material. This whole building is sided in 10-inch cedar clapboards from 1992. Uh, the cost now new on clear cedar claps is $14 a linear foot. So um, that siding is basically almost $20 a square foot. And that's not something you want to throw in a dumpster. Do we have any slides left or is that it? Yeah, and I was going to say we should wrap up to give, yeah. uh, to give, if Dave wants to chime in for a couple minutes on the work he's done in in Eastern Mass, and then uh, we can take questions. Sounds good. We'll have just to uh, maybe take a, uh, Dave, if you could offer, if you'd like to, we'll be able to take a few questions and then we have a few other things we want to um, wrap up with before three. So thank you. That was fantastic, Eric. Um, Dave Giese, would you like the floor for a few moments? Sure. Yeah, one of the things I thought I'd address is uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew's question about uh, using lumber in new construction. Uh, hi, Matthew. I heard about your retirement. Good luck. Um, I'll talk to you later about that. Um, Washington State and Oregon State uh, both have a uh, provision in their ordinance 
um, that uh, specifies how uh, lumber, used lumber can be used. And so I like to do the same thing in Massachusetts. Um, we're on a bit of a, a time crunch now because the new code, the 10th code is being reviewed right now and voted on uh, early next year. So at this point, I'm not sure if I'm gonna have time to get that ready for this uh, version of the code. Um, and I don't know how the, um, the voters, the panel uh, will look at uh, used lumber. They, they just voted on a provision for what they call native lumber, which is a uh, rough lumber cut locally. And um, the way that they included native lumber is they, um, they just uh, kind of downgraded by 25%. They use a percentage. In Washington and Oregon, um, they downgrade the grade that's stamped on the lumber in order to use it. So I think both those work. And uh, I want to talk to some builders and architects in the state and see what people have as a preference. Um, the other thing I would, I would um, mention, I just went to a uh, conference last week, Dave Benick was the uh, guest speaker there as well, uh, in uh, Troy, New York. And New York State is, is kind of at the same point we are in Massachusetts. Uh, they're also considering an ordinance, either local or statewide, and just starting to look at pros and cons at this point and trying to figure out how they can build up the industry in uh, New York State. So we might see some activity there. That was very interesting. They had a great uh, reading list included. Um, there was some material from San Antonio who's uh, working on a deconstruction ordinance and uh, some other cities around the country. And I thought I would, I would present that reading list to our group and maybe we can also make that public. I, this is all public information. So, um, and the, other, the last thing I would add is uh, when you look at uh, workforce development, I had really great luck working with an organization called ROCA in, um, in Massachusetts when I had my own deconstruction business. These are young kids. They've, they've been incarcerated when they were uh, teenagers. And ROCA just basically teaches them how to hold on a job. And the kids love to come to my projects. They were a great help for me. Uh, each group of kids that came had their own supervisor with them. Um, so it was really easy to coordinate. So um, as we look at uh, promoting deconstruction mass and getting, uh, getting companies started, I want to I wanted try to incorporate ROCA into that as well as a, as a great labor force uh, that's ready to go. Um, you just hire them as a subcontractor by the hour. Uh, that's really all I have. I think uh, we can open it up to general questions at this point. Okay, I'm gonna, um, let's see, can you guys hear me? Yes. Kathy can hear me, okay. Uh, I'm gonna throw out some questions that we've got in the chat um, and whoever wants to just uh, speak up, um, please feel free. But um, let's see, one of the questions is, what do you see as the most important thing to note about the distinction between residential deconstruction versus commercial deconstruction? I know the volume is what I've heard was one of the big, the big issues and finding a market for it. But does anybody want to speak to that? I'll, I'll chime in first. Um, so uh, typically people ask who, who are, who are the people buying the materials that you're generating? And I find they tend to generally tend to be homeowners for the most part. And they're still using stud for stud, but they're doing things like goat sheds, chicken, sheds additions on their house. It's not quite the same high volume, or high grade as the original use. And some of those um, back to the lumber grading may be exempt from, um, from grading requirements. So the materials that come out of a home are, are most easily reusable by homeowners and don't require a lot of specialization. The, um, the commercial stuff can generate homeowner useful stuff, but some of these buildings are so large that, for example, the lighting fixtures are out of scale for a home unless you've got a cathedral ceiling or somebody doesn't want to buy a plate glass window that's going to require a 12 foot header, those kinds of things. That's my two cents. Okay. Um, let me ask this question. So if non-friable asbestos is, uh, pre is present, so non-regulated in the structure, how does that affect the ability to deconstruct? Can anybody speak to that one? Uh, I started replying in the one. Um, the EPA requires remodeling or demolition to do a pre uh, asbestos survey, and they identify both the friable and the non friable. Uh, because we have our workers right in there with their hands, that all needs to be taken care of before we get there. Um, and times, as Dave 
um, alluded to, the process of deconstruction reveals material that did not get surveyed, in which case we usually have to pop and uh, redo that, um, that abatement. Um, sometimes, and I'm not super familiar with this because it's not my, um, it's not my specialty, but um, you know, if there's a certain low percentage of asbestos in, for example, a drywall or something like that, it can be crushed as a percentage, a component percentage, but we, we ask our projects to be clean. And we've definitely lost some projects because they had, for example, vermiculite everywhere or joint mm -hmm. compound that made it unsafe for our, our workers to be in there. Okay. Doing um, I really like this next question. What makes a city or a town deconstruction friendly? Anybody want to take a shot at that? <laughs> well, I, <clears throat> this is Dave Bannock. I, I travel around to a lot of cities helping out. So I guess I, I, uh, could speak to that. And everyone, uh, I mean, a lot of places I go, I was just speaking in Arizona um, earlier this week, and they said, you know, we don't have old buildings. We don't have beautiful brick buildings with beautiful wood, uh, reclaimed wood and things like that. You, you couldn't make it work here, right? And I'm like, no, we, um, we can make it work there if the people are uh, but then they say, but yeah, but maybe I go to another state and they say, hey, we're not, we're not environmentalists here. You know, we're just hardworking people, blue collar, you know, and, um, and so we, we don't buy into that, the whole uh, environmental movement and stuff like that. So then I go, well, we can make it there. And the reason is because there's always something like people like affordable materials or they like historic preservation or they like job creation or they like the environment or or they, um, they like the old materials. And so you have all of these things that make it work where depending on, so wherever we go, we highlight different things. Like in the Midwest, we call it harvesting buildings. You know, we, we change the wording, we'd call it harvesting buildings and so that they can relate to it more. And so I think um, it's funny, um, yeah, when I think about like what would make a city deconstruction friendly, it's, it's our, you know, to some degree, um, it's our job to sell it in such a way that they, it, you know, that they'll come around. So we're not writing off any cities is what I'm getting at. Um, but I think when we have mo more than one of those things going for us, like where we do have people that are do-it-yourselfers, uh, we do have people that need affordable materials, you do have an environmental ethic or something like that. When you start combining those things in a community, then it gets easier. And I, I suppose that um, sort of the holy grail would be if you are a city like uh, Portland, Oregon or San Antonio, Texas, or I believe Madison, Wisconsin, where you actually have an ordinance that's designed to preserve the historic value of neighborhoods and therefore prohibits de um, demolition and requires deconstruction if it's an older home, then then you've kind of got the, you've got the hammer. Um, yeah, from from the local local government, um, but that's not e not an easy. It's a pretty high bar to get to, and I know we've had that conversation, Dave, about you got to start doing it as well, even if you don't have an ordinance. Um, let's see. So um, this is an interesting one: is how do we promote deconstruction and salvage without skipping the first priority of building reuse? And I I don't know much about it, but adaptive reuse of buildings is something that um, our group has talked a little bit about. Does anybody want to? Um, respond to that? Um, I get called in by people who are just tire kicking. And some of my first questions are, what were you using this for? What are you trying to do? Sometimes I'll talk people out of taking something down. I come from the building trades and, you know, people call me all the time. I'm buying a, a house in Vermont and the building, the uh, house inspector said the barn's ready to fall down. And uh, the truth is that the barn's been there for 150 years and with PLC, they could probably be there for another 50. Um, and so if there's an option to uh, repair a building, I definitely add that. We sometimes get brought in when, when somebody is um, trying to um, move a house and they can't have a house mover for it, for example. Um, or there's, it's a historic building and they've tried to offer it to the community and, and nonprofits can't find a way to make it work. 
Um, but there's, there's certainly an educational component in what is in a building. This building has good bones. What, what if we just strip this building back? You can bring in your new mechanicals. You can bring in your new, um, you know, high efficiency insulation. And I did this last week. I had a homeowner buy a spec house uh, with cash and like, we want to take this down and build another house. It's a desirable building lot. I'm like, well, let's, let's do this in a two-step process. Let's strip this back to studs. And then you bring your architect in here and you bring, you know, you bring in your quotes for HVAC and, you know, bring it up to code. You can do all that. You can do all that exploration once we've got this building opened up for you. Right now, it looks like a, you know, a shithole of a rental that nobody would want to live in. But the roof line square, the wall lines are square. I don't see any indication of rot here. It was a building that was meant to breathe. So it doesn't have the spray foam in it and it doesn't have some of the other reasons that buildings deteriorate. Let's take off the things that we don't want, the extra chimneys and you know, get all that out of the way. And now you can reevaluate your home. And then if you want to take it all the way down, we're halfway there. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Let's see, um, we've got a lot of activity in the chat here and we're running short on time. I'm just trying to see if I can hit on a few other things that we haven't. Um, one one thing broke too, just so you know, is that the speakers have suggested we could also capture the questions from the chat and they can put together some answers and yes. we can sh share that out with attendees. Um, I think that would be uh, a great resource as well because Yes. Having these folks in the room is just a wealth of information. And I think the questions can, we could go on for a long time. <laughs> All right, then I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll say questions are over, but, but they will be answered. We're gonna grab all these from the, from the chat and distribute them and you'll hear back from us. We'll send that out to everybody. Um, and we do have a couple quick announcements um, about grants. Grant, um, Kathy, yeah. go ahead. I'm going to actually zip forward and let Chris Beeling, if you want to unmute real briefly, Chris, and just mention, just take a moment on the federal grants, and then Brooke will speak briefly about the DEP micro grants. Yeah. Hi. Thanks so much for your um, time. This is Chris Beeling from EPA. And um, unprecedented funding for solid waste right now. Just want to bring up that there are three grant opportunities open, and the second two that you see on your screen uh, what we're calling SWIFR, Solid Waste Infrastructure for Recycling Grants for Political Subdivisions, that's municipalities, parishes, counties, the like, and our educational outreach program for NGOs um, are open. So I put the link in the chat, take a look. Federal grants are a big lift, but again, this is unprecedented funding and opportunity and just wanna make sure everybody here knows about it. So enough for that. And um, let's move on to the state, more money to talk about. Sorry, I'm going to zip through these here. Oh, so that, yeah. I'm sorry. So the other thing I just want to say, one quick thing. See that recycling toolkit, model recycling <laughs> toolkit? Um, keep going, Kathy. I'll just talk as you go. Okay. Um, that just basically is a compilation of uh, lots of things that we're talking about uh, for um, municipalities. So take a peek if you're a municipality and you want to see a nice um, conglomeration of what's going on all over the country uh, with recycling, uh, education, and outreach. So. Okay. Thanks, Chris. And I'm just going to make a real quick plug for MassDEP's um, program. This is a micro grant for reduce, reuse, repair, share, not recycling, not organics diversion. It's got to be upstream projects, very small $5,000 uh, cap for nonprofit and for profit organizations. We have, we've been funding these for a couple of years now. Uh, we have not seen anybody come in with a project for um, deconstruction. So um, you know, the monies can pay for equipment. If you need equipment to do some decon, it could be for staff. It could be for marketing purposes. Um, you can reach out to Janice Perre. Her name is um, there in her email to talk about your idea before you submit it. We take the applications on a rolling basis and then we award quarterly. So um, we'd love to see some projects come in um, on deconstruction. Awesome, thank you so much. And out of respect for your time, we have one minute left. So I'm going to just very quickly move us to the next one, which is um, 
really just to let folks know about our next meeting and what we have planned. So when we did our kickoff meeting in September, we took a poll from attendees to ask which topics folks were most interested in. We have a pretty long list of topics, frankly, but these were the three that came out at the top on the left there. So reuse markets, uh, deconstruction ordinances, and then design for reuse. So we are hoping to do our next meeting and planning to in the spring, in March. Um, we don't have a date set yet, but we will let you know. We're looking for speakers. Um, I don't know if we have time. If you have any ideas you want to pop in the chat with our last minute or so that we have, um, but feel free to do so, or you can always reach out to me and or Brooke directly if you have ideas um, in, in terms of what we can share for that discussion this spring about reuse markets for these building materials. And then just to close, I wanted to just thank everyone for being with us today. I know I'm incredibly inspired by the speakers and what they share today. It's just extraordinary. And I really do hope that we can bring more of this to um, the reuse marketplace here in Massachusetts. Um, this has some information on the slide if you'd like to tap into our reduce and reuse working group. And I wanna just thank everybody who's here today, thank the presenters and wish you all a happy holidays and look forward to seeing you in the spring. Thank you all so very much. Thanks folks, bye-bye. Thank Thanks everybody.